I'm going to be talking about words. And you think, really? We use them all the time. We use words. Like, um, they're very utilitarian. Just like, just like people's homes are filled with furnishings and whatever. I take a look at this picture, and you know, it's pretty well appointed. Uh, it, um, as far as houses go, it's a very nice house. But as far as it goes, there's, there's just, it's, it's functional. It's more than adequate. Just like our everyday conversations are kind of like this. They, they, get the, they get the job done, but they meet the need. However, there are points in time when we could add that elegant wallpaper, and all of a sudden it changes. It changes the tone. It adds, it adds class. It adds sophistication. It adds an elegance and style as we go along. And we do the same thing with our words. And there are points in time when we, when we use our words kind of like a, a master craftsman will use his tool to, to build, to create, to repair. These well-used, familiar tools, and there are some words that we use that have that capability. But there's also, we also have a personal arsenal available at our, well, I'd say fingertips, but it's right there on the tip of our tongue. Words that do not bring healing, words that do not bring, do not bring uh, construction. These are words of destruction, words with power, words that words that tear down, words that attack and destroy, words that decimate. How's that for a wallpaper word? But words in and of themselves are pretty innocuous or harmless. By themselves, they, they have no meaning as to, to what we do with them. Some are salubrious. Whoa. Whoa. Of course, we all know what salubrious means. Oh, yeah. Salubrious means it's good for your health. Words that are good for you. And so we, we use words like this. Or they words might be ostentatious. Ostentatious. These are words that are kind of pretentious. You don't like the word ostentatious. <laughs> kind of showing the thing that we do that we show off with, and we use our words to do this. Some of our words are you really quite ubiquitous. Wow, ubiquitous. That means you find them everywhere. These are those common words that you hear all the time. And there's a lot of words in our in our lexicon that we are that are very common. They are ubiquitous. But there are others, some other words that express disapprobation. This is where these, this is a word that, these are words that, that, that show disapproval or are very critical. <clears throat> and so these are just simply words that we, that we use. You know, I selected these words <laughs> purposely because these are like that wallpaper that we use. And when I'm teaching writing to my third and fourth graders, I say these are like those $5 words rather than those nickel and 50 cent piece words. These are like those $5 words because they, they are expressive. They are big. They are impressive. But just like that elegant wallpaper, we can dress up our language. But you know, no matter how big the word is that we, that we choose to use, sometimes the most powerful words in our language are the little, little ones. The very small words. Like if. Nothing much impressive about this, but yet this one word can express can express regret. It can express conditions. If only I had listened. If only I had waited. If you do this, then I will do this. The word says in 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people mm -hmm. who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, yep. then will I hear from heaven. There's a condition there. If and then, but that word if is very, very powerful. It's not, it's not ostentatious. It is very common. Now, another word, another one of these little short words that none of us ever want to hear, especially 
Well, again, a two-year-old uses it all the time. What is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. We don't want to hear that word. No, you may not do that. No, you can't go there. No, I don't want to do this. No, no, no. <laughs> now, we don't necessarily have to be so emphatic with the word no. It can just simply be no. Jesus used this word in John 14, 6. He says, and we talked about this last week, and we didn't, and, and there are people who don't want to hear this. No one can come to the Father except through me. It is still, it still has a negative connotation. It still is kind of exclusionary. It says, yes, no. This is not, this will not be done. No is powerful. In other words, let's consider this, uh, this scenario. All right, every six months, sometimes it's more frequently than that, I have to go and get my blood work done. And then I go talk to my, go, go talk to my physician. And we're sitting there, and we're having this conversation. You know, he's such a likable fellow. I really like him. And he says, you know, you know my, your test results look really good. And you have this pregnant pause, and you're waiting for it. What word are you waiting for? <laughs> It may be small, but I'm telling you, this word is big. This word is powerful. This little word has, can, it's like, it's like your whole world hinges on this word. Everything's great, but, and you are just waiting for that shoe to drop. Tiny little word, but yet so very powerful. But I'm here to tell you that this morning there's another word that's even far more powerful than that for us to talk about. It is one that elicits faith. It's one that, that elicits hope in us. It's one that builds expectation. It's a word that, that fuels our anticipation. Something that we're looking forward to. It also awakens inside of us a sense of resolve and encouragement. This one little word can do all of that. And I'm certain that you're sitting there and you're wondering, what word can possibly do all of that? Jesus. It's the word that I haven't given you yet. The word is yet. Yet is such a powerful word, it, it, it awakens so much within us. It is one that has multiple meanings, has multiple, um, multiple expressions, multiple uh, applications that we can use it in so many different ways. The word itself is used 708 times in the King James Version. This is a word that, that God uses. Jeremiah used it in chapter 50. Jeremiah, you have to remember, is a young man when he was called. He was probably 18 or 19. I remember being 18 and 19. I was beginning to sense a call of God on my life. But uh, my call was to go to Bible college and to be involved in the ministry at that point in time. Jeremiah was called to preach to the nation, to speak to the kings, to speak to the religious leaders. And to tell them things that they did not want to hear. He was speaking that they just re had to remember. The kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom, had already been dispersed by the Assyrians 100, 200 years beforehand. He's speaking to, he's speaking to Judah, to Jerusalem. And Babylon is standing at the gate waiting. God is, God is saying, if you don't change, this is what's going to happen. This was his message. And, Je and Jeremiah had to endure all of the, all of that, all of the mistreatment. He had to watch the prophecy come true as wave after wave of people were, were carted out of there. And he was left. The king of Babylon didn't want him. 
he was left. And see, he, he's writing here as, as, he's, as he's becoming an older man, and he's saying, this is what the Lord Almighty says. The people of Israel are oppressed, and the people of Judah as well. All their captors hold them fast, refusing to let them go. This sounds very desperate. It sounds very ominous. Yet, there's that hopeful word. Yet, their Redeemer is strong. Even though they are being held captive, even though they are not being let free, even though there is no, there is no apparent re resolution to this matter, even so, yet, their Redeemer is strong. The Lord Almighty is His name. He will vigorously defend their cause so that He may bring rest to their land, but unrest to those who live in Babylon. Despite the circumstance, despite the circumstance, there is hope, there is faith, there is, he remains, despite the, the regardless of, of Assyria, regardless of Babylon, God remained strong. Centuries before Jeremiah, this psalm was written, Psalm 78, it's written by uh, Asaph. Oftentimes, whenever we think about the Psalms, we attribute them to, to David, and he wrote a lot of them. But this is a Psalm of Asaph, and we read this one. He says, it's, and he's speaking, of the, uh, he's speaking of the years that the uh, Israelites wandered in the desert, those 40 years in the wilderness. Yet, even though, even though Israel was, was cantankerous and bullheaded and headstrong, yet, God was merciful. He forgave their iniquities and did not destroy them. You remember, God wanted so often times to say, I'm just going to wipe them out. I'm going to start all over with you, Moses. And Moses pled their case again and again. Time after time, he restrained his anger and did not stir up his full wrath. Despite those circumstances, despite our circumstances, from the past, our present circumstances, or even the future that's out there. And as we're taking a look and trying to fill, to, to look down the, down the, and see what the future would hold, despite that, even, even if, even if our circumstances are filled with suffering, even if it's filled with loss and disappointment, you're talking about the end of February, beginning in March. Today is an anniversary of mine as well. It's been 36 years ago that my first wife died today. Okay, and that day, that day comes and goes, and I, and I remember. Yet, God. There is, and this is what we're talking about. These are, we're talking about life-changing events that come in, and they, they change the, the, the course of our lives. I mean, I was heading down a different path. I was, I was well on my way to being involved in the ministry up in Michigan, and could have been a district superintendent by this point in time. Could have been retired by this point in time. <laughs> but God... There is a determined resolve that comes with this word, yet. God was, was not going to let his people perish. God was not going to let me perish. God will not let you perish. God will not let us go down that kind of road. Regardless of my circumstances, yet will I grumble. Yet will I falter? Yet will I brood? Complain. Yet will I complain? That's the next thing on here. <laughs> next, will, will, I, will I become bitter? Will I be angry? Will I become violent? That's not what the word says. Yet will I. And we can fill that in. We all have the, cap the capability, we have the capacity to do all of those things, but we have the capability and capacity to do this, too. Yet will I rejoice 
I've told you the story before. After Lynn died, Father comes back a few months later and he says, now I want you to praise me for it. I said, Father, you've got some audacity to, <laughs> to ask for this of me. And I had no idea how I would do it, but because you asked, yet will I rejoice. And I can say today, I do rejoice. I do give praise because it has changed me. I am so much more dependent upon him. I know him so much deeper than I ever could have otherwise. It was a hard thing, but it was a good thing. As Habakkuk states in Habakkuk 3, and we know this, we know this, this scripture. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, and though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls. Okay, this goes, this is going back, and we're and we're taking a look, even though the past has been unbearable, even though the past has been so very, very difficult to handle, even though our, even though our, present, our present circumstances are difficult and we don't know how, how we're supposed to make it, and even if the, the future looks in, ex, entirely bleak and without hope, yet will I rejoice. Yet, that determined resolve, will I rejoice in the Lord? I will be joyful. I am resolved to praise, to rejoice, and to be joyful. It is a choice I can make. I am capable of it. I am resolved. I will yet Praise. As it says in Psalm 42, this one is written by the sons of Korah. And oftentimes we, have, we want to attribute this one to, to David as he's hiding in the cave. But he, here, the sons of Korah are asking, Why, my soul, are you so downcast? Have you ever asked that question? Why do I feel so bad today? What's going on? I feel so down. Why are you downcast? Why are you disturbed within me? And then he's talking to himself and says, Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Resolution. Not like we talk about at the beginning of the year, but this is that resolve. I will. David was well acquainted with grief, well acquainted with struggle, and well acquainted with loss, anguish. And he says, here in Psalm 9, he says, I will give thanks to you, God, to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. <coughs> will, will. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. Yet, God, this word is very small, very short, only three letters, but I'm telling you it packs a powerful punch. Not only does it speak of resolve, it also speaks of reassurance. It speaks of encouragement. Even if you're, in the, if you're facing adversity, if there feels like there's so many things coming against us right now, if it's coming against us, if, you, if we're living in bondage, if there's something that has grabbed hold of us and won't let go, and sometimes that can be one of those besetting sins, it can be a, a mindset, it can be any, it can be an illness that we are just in bondage to. It could be that we're simply feeling lost. There are lost people around us who do not who do not know the Lord, and there are points in time in our lives when we kind of feel like we've lost our way and we're lost. Points in time when we feel very, very vulnerable. We don't feel safe about things. 
There are points in time when we are helpless. When we cannot, we cannot stand on our own. We cannot, we cannot assist ourselves. There are points in time when we are aimless, without purpose. You thought I forgot about purpose, didn't you? Oh, no. <laughs> when we are without purpose and we're wandering around, Father, what is it that you want us to do? Jesus, Jesus spoke about this. When we can become so consumed with everything going on around us, when we take our eyes off of, of, of what he is capable of doing, he says, I love this indigo bunting. I just it's thought beautiful. it was a beautiful picture. I would that we had far more of them around here. Look at the birds of the air. We don't typically pay much attention to them, do we? They do not sow or reap or store away in barns. And yet, your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than them? You see, and yet, you see, don't give up. There's, there's, there's encouragement here. He is re he reassures us of our value. John is he's he's speaking about the Son of Man here. Jesus came. He came to that which was his own. Jesus came. And they did not receive him. Yet, we, re we rejected him. And yet, this is our reassurance to all who did receive him. To those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So regardless of how we accepted him or how we treated him, we remain valuable. He encourages us. He reassures us of his love for us. And this is what we see here in Romans, in Romans 5. It says, but God, there's another one big word. But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Be encouraged. Be reassured. This word yet is a beautiful, beautiful word. It carries with it so many, so many meanings. What else, might it can, what else does it convey? I gave you a list at the very beginning. Many things that this, this, that this word conveys. It conveys faith and expectancy. Faith is believing because we know. Expectancy means there is, it's going to happen. This word is crippling. This is more than a word, though. In the face of fear, it's very hard to see. It's very hard to see father's, father's interactions, father's love, father's, father's hope. It's very hard to have faith and encouragement during this time, expectancy. In the face of uncertainty, and we live in very uncertain times right now. There's a lot of fear. We talked we, we talk just a moment ago about, about people fe feeling afraid, and oftentimes people will turn. But fear does not drive people to the cross. Fear drives people away from the cross and, in, and into their own, uh, their own cave to be of, of protection here. And stress. I can attest to this one. There, this, this, these past couple weeks have been extraordinarily stressful. And as we're looking forward to this coming week, whenever the whole system changes yet again with our jobs, we, are, we face these things daily. Many folks struggle with doubt. Did God really say? Is he truly here? Is he, does he really care? When there's confusion, 
I don't understand what's going on. I don't know why I have to go through this. But I'm so tired. This is where we live. We need, we need some faith. We need some, we need encouragement. We need some expectancy. Jesus, again, we're talking about those birds. Consider those, those sparrows. A sparrow is one of the most common birds out there. Tiny, tiny little bird. I'm always impressed at how, though, how very loud they sing. <laughs> but they're, they're, they're nondescript. But he says, and he's talking about them, because again, we don't, we don't pay them a whole lot of mind. He says, aren't two sparrows sold for a penny? You know, they're not even a dime a dozen. It's a, it's a, uh, it, there's, there are, they're, they're easy to overlook. They're not valuable. And yet, and yet, not one of them falls to the ground, but what Father notices. These things that we take for granted, these things that we place no value in, Father puts extraordinary value on them. Not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs on your head are numbered. And for some of us, there's fewer and fewer of those. So that's a countdown. So don't be afraid. Because you are worth more than many sparrows. Have faith. Have expectancy. We believe because we know. The writer of Hebrews is talking about this business of expectancy. And so many of us think, you know, where is this Jesus you're talking about? Where is he? It's been such a long time. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is talking about. He says, in, in putting everything under him, being, being Jesus, God left nothing that is not subject to him. And so we say, we, Jesus, Jesus is the Lord of all. He is our Savior. Be, where is he? Because yet, at present, we do not see everything subject to him. I look around the world and think, you know, Jesus, if you were truly in control, things wouldn't be like this, would they? But there is a, an expectancy. Yet, at present, what does that tell me? There is a future. We do not see Jesus, who is made lower than the angels for a while, and now crowned. But we do see Jesus, who is made lower and now crowned with glory and with honor, because he suffered death. So that by the grace of God, we might, that he might taste death for everyone. This is the promise. This is our hope. This is our expectancy. And John picks up and says, Dear friends, because of this, because of this death, because of this resurrection, because of the cross, we have been made children of God. And what we now, and what we will be, has not yet been made known. Aren't you glad that way, the way things are right now is not the way things are always going to be? That is our, that is our expectancy. That is our, that is our faith. But we know, and this is where that faith is, believing because we know, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. But we shall see him as he is. Yet we know. Yet has one more meaning I want us to take a look at today. Yet, I will, and we've, we've talked about this already, but this is, this is something else. Yet, I will, in the face of all of these things, I will despair? No. I will surrender? No. 
I will fail. I will fall. We don't, we don't, I would like to think we don't do those things purposely. We are capable of doing all of them. But the word says, yep, I will hope. You see, hope is one of those things that's difficult to find. We are very familiar with the story of Job. We know that Job had suffered the loss of everything, suffered the loss of his possessions, suffered the loss of his children, suffered the loss of his health. The only thing he didn't suffer the loss of was his wife and his friends, and he suffered the presence of them. <laughs> Though he slay me, and we hold on to this, though he slay me, yet, do you feel that hope? Here he is sitting on that ash heap, scraping, scraping his wounds. Yet, there is hope. Yet, will I hope in him. I will surely defend my ways to his face. He knew that God had not left him. He knew that even though all of these other things took place, they were temporary. That's what we need to be reminded of as well. Yet, I will hope. There is a sense of hope and anticipation that comes with this word, yet. Anticipation means I am I am looking forward to it. I am <laughs> Dairy Cream Corner opens on the 13th. <laughs> there is the anticipation. You sense it. <laughs> but this is in a real sense. Hope and anticipation. This year, this past year, I mean, it hasn't even been a full 12 months since we went into, went into quarantine and into lockdown. 12, 13 months ago, we began hearing the rumblings of this coronavirus, having no idea what it was going to be. And yet, as we looked around this room, there are masks everywhere, and we're wearing shields and everything, and we have all this personal protective equipment that we have. But we have concerns about our health and safety. We have concerns about our provision. There are many people across this nation who have, their, their businesses have shut down, their jobs are gone. They wonder about where their next meal is going to come from. They wonder how they're going to pay the utilities or keep their, keep their rent paid or pay their mortgage. We are wondering about provision. There's a lot of anxiety that comes with this because these are circumstances that are so far beyond our control and everything in us wants to grab hold of it and say, this will stop. And yet, we have no power whatsoever. We're anxious about the numbers. We're anxious about every day. I mean, I pull up and I look to see what the numbers are on, for Marion County. Well, are we still green? Yes, we are, just barely. We're back at a 2.94 or something. There's anxiety. And there is a longing. A longing for the day when these things disappear, when the masks can come off, when we can go wherever we choose and not have to worry. Oh, for the good old days. It may be a little while. But we have hope. Going back and re revisiting Jeremiah, knowing his story, knowing his backstory, he wrote the book of Lamentations also. He's a man of, of affiliated of, with grief. He, he understood it, of suffering, of anxiety, of anguish. And as, he, and as he's coming to the end of his life, he's writing these words. He says, and I remember my affliction and my wandering his city was torn apart. There was no protection. He was, he was abused and misused. I remember the bitterness 
and the gall, that which creeps down inside of us and very difficult to deal with. I well remember when, I well remember them, and my soul is downcast inside me. Did he have a right or a reason to be downcast, to be upset, to be depressed, to be, to be distressed? Every, every reason. And yet, yet, this I call upon, and therefore, I have hope. What does he remember? What does he call to mind? He can't change the circumstances. He, he can't go back and rewrite history. It is what it is. But he can move forward. And yet, this is what I call to mind. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. Times are, times are difficult. Times are hard. Times are uncertain. But we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. What's new every morning? His compassions. His mercies. They great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion. Therefore, I will wait for him. The Lord is my portion. He is my sustenance. He is my provision. And I will rest in him. It is enough. His mercies, his compassions are renewed toward me every morning. Solomon in the book of, in the book of the Proverbs says this, talking about having hope. The hope of the righteous will be gladness. Are you righteous? If we are among the called according to his name, if we have the righteousness of Christ imputed to us like we were talking about last week and the week before, the hope of the, the, hope of the righteous will be gladness. There are better days ahead. But the ex expectation of the wicked will perish. Those who, those who do not know, those who, who, who refuse, those who do not accept the comfort that, that is Christ himself, there is very little hope. There is very little expectation. We are simply victims of, of our current circumstances. This morning, I just want to, I want to encourage us. And this is what Paul says here in Romans 12, 12. And just as, as we are moving forward here, be joyful in hope. You see, Father has yet to have the last word. Be joyful in hope. Be patient in affliction. While these days are difficult, and while we, we, may, we may yet suffer, be joyful, be patient, and be faithful in prayer is what the Word says. It feels like this sometimes, doesn't it? <laughs> We're at the end of the rope, and it's fraying out. But brothers and sisters, hold on. Hold on. I realize this has been a very difficult time and that we have some difficult days ahead of us. But hold on and be encouraged. I like this picture because it's, we, as, as children, we sang that song. He's got the whole world in his hands, but yet we forget that our God is so much greater than this universe that, that, he, that he created. He has enfolded himself into it, and yet he exists outside of it. He's got this. Be encouraged. And although it may seem messy at moments, 
may feel like things are just spinning out of control. But understand this. He's not finished. He's still working. God isn't finished with us yet. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that, that you that you aren't finished. Thank you for the hope. Thank you for the expectancy. Thank you for the encouragement. Thank you for the for the strength that, that we can that we can that we can gain from, from this word. Father, although our circumstances and although our past, although the present, although the future, although all of these things may look bleak, they may be difficult. We have hope. We will rejoice because you aren't finished yet. Yet will I praise you. Yet will I rejoice. Yet will I rest. We ask that you will continue to be with this people. I pray, Father, that you will build your kingdom here in this place. I pray, Father, that, that, the, that you will release the, the, uh, the resources of heaven and that you will give us the opportunities to to accomplish your purpose here in this place. Lord Jesus, be exalted here in this place. We ask this in your name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.